Okay, please help me welcome our speaker tonight, Joe M. from the Way Out Group, Austin, Texas. Me out. Um, hi, y'all. My name is Joe McFadden. I'm an extremely grateful alcoholic. My sobriety date, and sometimes it's a severity date, is uh, June 14, 1993. And for that, I'm extremely grateful. It's a privilege to be up here. In fact, it's a it's a privilege to be asked to go anywhere, especially uh, paying back um, all the things that Alcoholics Anonymous has given and done for me. My home group is the Away Out group in Bastrop, Texas, and it is a wonderful group. It's much like this group. There's lots of enthusiasm, uh, lots of good people. We uh, believe that the Alcoholic Anonymous meeting is between the Serenity Prayer and the Lord's Prayer, and where it says on page 19 that a much we think a man is unthinking when he says sobriety is enough. A much more important demonstration of these principles are needed in his respective home life and occupation. And so we believe the meeting is between the serenity prayer and the Lord's prayer. But where AA, where the rubber meets the road, is between the Lord's prayer and the serenity prayer. What are we doing outside there? What kind of a program do I have? You ask my bill collectors, you ask my wife, you ask my children, you ask my neighbors, you ask my community. That's where we know if this program really works. I don't come here, um, um, I don't have bumper stickers on the back of my car that says easy does it or the circle and triangle because there are times that you don't want to know I'm in AA. <laughs> you know what I mean? But if you come to my home group, we're going to have literature-based meetings. We're going to have a big book study. We're going to have a step study. If you come in there and you're a newcomer, we're going to get your number. We're going to talk to you about three things. And if you're a real alcoholic, the kind that it describes on page 21 of our big book, and you meet the two qualifying questions on page 44, they're the only three things that you have a shot at getting well, and they're the only three things, if you fit that criteria, that are going to lead you to the solution, which is, of course, as we all know, God. And that is these three things. We're going to talk to you about steps. We're going to talk to you about the big book. And we're going to talk to you about the dreaded S word, sponsorship. And I'm going to tell you something. If you're new here, stay away from those people who are coming up to you and they're looking for someone to sponsor. Sponsors are a bad deal. I'm going to tell you this right now. They have a tendency of sooner or later poking their nose in your personal business. Don't get a sponsor unless you want to get well. I think the single most important aspect of Alcoholics Anonymous for me is sponsorship. It's not so much that I have a sponsor and that I sponsor it's that I am accountable to my sponsor and that through that accountability, I am sponsorable. That is the single most important part of Alcoholics Anonymous to me. Um, I will talk to you tonight about two things. And when I came in, I hit one, a horrendous bottom. I'm a guy that was never supposed to live free in society. I was supposed to be locked up in caged mental wards. And I'm a guy who had been in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous for 13 years and couldn't get this. And I'm a guy at 15 years sober that wanted to die because I forgot to put the main thing, keep the main, the way the civil rights movement had that slogan, the main thing is keep the main thing the main thing. So if you're sitting out there and you're new and you hate yourself because you can't get sober and you know you're dry right now, but you also know you're probably going to get drunk if your history repeats itself, I'd like to talk to you. And there's a second, second person, that's, and I know this person's here tonight, is you, you may have double-digit sobriety, but it's lost its luster. Your checking account may be overdrawn. You may be close to a divorce. Your kids may hate you. You may be having a rough time with your career. And you're going to meetings here in the same old, same old, all over and over and over again. I want to know. That's called the second surrender, and I want you to know I know what that's about. 
See, we have a disease of alcoholism, and it's a disease that doesn't need for us to take a drink to kill us. And I'll talk to you about my experience with those two things. My sponsor said that when I get up here that I am to talk to those two people. I am to get up here, and as when we do the third step, it says, God, relieve me of the bondage of self. And i got to tell you, sometimes I feel like I must be a masochist who's into S&M sometimes. Because, <laughs> you know, um, and, and relieve me of the bondage of self. Why? So that you can take away my difficulties so that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. So hopefully I'm going to get up here and I'm going to cheerlead for God and tell you there's a little bit of hope at the end of the tunnel for you. And that's what I want to do. I want to get up here and I want to tell you about this miracle that's transpired in Joe McFadden's life. I, I hear people all the time saying... I want justice. I want justice. These people have done me wrong. Let me tell you something. If I got justice, I'd be frying for about five more years in an electric chair before, before they turn the electricity off. I want mercy. Uh, my sponsor also taught me a prayer, and I shared this with uh, Sarah. And I just want to say something. This Facebook is a phenomenon. I, I, Steve, I feel like he's my brother and Sarah, my sister. We, we, we're friends on Facebook. We talk every day. There isn't an aspect of my story they haven't already read or heard about. I mean, Bill Wilson in 1960 wrote a letter said uh, about the Colossus communication of the future. If used unselfishly and, and, and guarded, that we can't imagine what's going to go on. And I'm sponsoring guys all over the world now because of this Facebook. It's just incredible. So I... Um, I'm very thankful for that, and, and it's nice to see Eric again. I don't know where he is, but I, I love Eric, and congratulations. I met him. Um, I think I impressed his, his, uh, his, his uh, soon-to-be wife uh, when we met out in Las Vegas in December. I said, you just remember one thing. You are the treasure, and he is the pirate. And she, and she automatically said, I like that guy. <laughs> But the prayer that my sponsor taught me is this. He said, before you get up there, there's a couple of prayers and a couple of things I want you to say. And the first one is it was and I'm not sure this is a history of it, but I understand this to be is it was a quadriplegics prayer written by a saint who became a quadriplegic. I don't know how he wrote it. I, you know, I, that's the way my mind goes. I, I they point at something and I say, well, let me look at the finger. You know, I don't look at the thing they're pointing at, but my ears are popping. Um. So anyway, it goes like this. It says, I am the place where God shines through. He and I are one, not two. I need not worry, fret, or plan. He wants me where and as I am. And if I be relaxed and free, he will carry out his plan through me. And I usually say that. I never have said that from the podium. But that's what I always say before I come up and talk. And then I say, Let the words be thine, let the voice be mine, and then I get the heck out of the way. And that's what I hope. Uh, One time I spoke, first time I ever spoke, a couple things happened that really uh, touched me. The first one was um, a guy came up and said, man, that was the best talk I ever heard in my life. And I thought, oh, really? Of course, I grabbed him by the ear and said, well, tell me more, you know. (laughs) Apparently, he heard someone else's talk. Because he told me things that I know I didn't say. So the point of it is, is you're going to hear whatever you need to hear here, okay? And if you don't, it's your own darn fault. And the second thing was, is that I I spoke and I uh, really gave one of the best talks I ever gave in my life. And about 10 minutes before it was time to be up, unbeknownst to me, this lady comes up and says, Joe, 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 Joe. I said, what? I'm in the middle of saving souls for Jesus here. And she says, you got 10 minutes left. Get sober. <laughs> so I'm a little bit more careful about this. Okay, so I'll, I'll start my talk now. Like I said, I'm the kind of guy who, there was a lady who was 14, there was a girl who was 14 years old. And she was raped. And she was mentally ill. And I am her son. I am a product of that. And I grew up under some of the worst conditions you can imagine. And I went through my life. 
I was a stutterer. I went to special ed. And um, I had lots of problems. And I always grew up with a chip on my shoulder. And, you know, I always thought that was why I was an alcoholic. One of the things about me is that I always felt like I never fit in. I always felt like I wanted you to think I was a cross between Dennis Hopper, Keith Richards, and John Dillinger. (laughs) But I always knew you knew I was a stutterer, retard, bedwetter. And I never would let you get close enough so that you would get to know me. I'm the kind of guy, I've been divorced three times. I always, I never have been fired, and a woman's never divorced me or broke up with me. I always quit or divorced before they could do it first. I'm a cutter and a runner. And I always felt like there was this big circle with y'all in it, and there was this little teeny tiny circle with me in it. And I didn't know what that was about. And there was this line right there that separated us. And what I found out through a guy named Chuck Chamberlain is that line is the ego. Einstein called it the optical illusion of consciousness. It doesn't exist. Einstein also coined a phrase. He said the greatest illusion of mankind is that there's more than one of us here. And see, my ego's job is to separate me from you, me from God, and me from myself. And I went around feeling that way. In other words, what happens when you take the alcohol? What do you have left when you take the alcohol away from the alcoholic? What do you have left? That's right. And let me tell you something. I walked around all the time feeling like that ick. I tried to hang myself when I was nine years old. I just said, man, there is no way I can make it through this. My goodness. Until I started uh, running around with some of the guys and they told me something. I'm sure the conversation didn't go like this, but it could have. They could have said, you know, Joe, you're suffering from a spiritual malady. And we've got a solution for this. You know, we're going to break into old man Mahoney's garage, and he's got this Mets beer, and it is the elixir of life for guys like you. And you're going to have to be willing to try this and drink. And I didn't know, but... I went out after we stole that beer and we put it in the creek and I went out and I drank. I'm telling you, something magic happened. Here was this pimple-faced, bedwetter stutter that went to special ed who drank that. And I'm telling you, a miracle happened. I turned into the most handsome guy in the world. I never stuttered. I was smart. There's two things that I found out when I drank and when I got sober, they're the worst two things that ever happened to me as I lost them is I could read other people's mind and I could tell the future. And when I got sober, I took that away. You know, God took it away or something. I don't know what that was about. But anyway, I drank that and I went crazy. I had a great time. I felt good. When I hear people in meetings talking bad about alcohol, I want to go up and smack them. It's like, you know, it's like talking about an old girlfriend of mine. You know, oh, yeah, she's gained 100 pounds, but when I was dating her, she's beautiful. Don't you say anything bad about her, you know. It's just the the booze really did it for me. It made me feel so good. I drank that, and I didn't have a problem in the world. I was in that big circle. In fact... That big circle now was in my little circle, and it was crowded, and you all loved me. Y'all just say, Joe, thank you for inviting me into your world. I love you. I felt great. It talks about in the 12 and 12, sometimes the pain and suffering of sobriety become more constant and acute than when we were drinking because we've taken away our medication. Little did I know that what had transpired in my life was going to, the absence of that feeling was going to be worse than anything I've ever known. And little did I know would I do anything in the world, no matter who I hurt or what I had to do to get that and get more. Because you see, when I first drank, I had fun. All of this was fun and it was great and it was wonderful. And What I didn't know was that the other guys I drank with would say, Joe, you know, you ought to knock that off. I said, excuse me, 
you're no longer my friend. Jesus, why don't you go home and sew with your mom or something? My God, you know. I wanted to get whatever. I, I wanted to do it, and whatever we were doing, I wanted to do it more. And I felt great. And then as I started drinking, the fun got to be fun. So then what I do, I would have to start finding whiskey. I'd have to start doing outside issues. And I would start doing that. And then it got to be fun. And then the worst thing in the world that can happen to a guy like me. I got where I couldn't get to it. And I would overshoot it. And Chuck Chamberlain called it. I reached a point where I couldn't put anything between me and me. And if there is a hell, it's got to be there. You know, in Alcoholics Anonymous, we pass the seventh tradition and we say there are no dues or fees. We're fully self-supporting. That may be true, but I'm going to tell you my take on that is I believe we've got the highest initiation and membership fee in the world. And I'll tell you something. Page 30 tells me that. It's, it, it talks about page 30, 31. I'm going to summarize it this way. Brief periods of recovery followed always still by worse relapse, which in time led to pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. As a class of people, those four words, that pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization, there isn't another class of people in the world that know those four words better than us. It is just, it's, it's horrible to feel that way. I just... It, it, it was just painful. I think about that. There's a word in the big book, and I didn't know what it was, but as a class of people, no one knows that word better than us. Self-loathing. I looked it up, and it, it's, it's extreme contempt, disgust, and hatred for oneself. It's where I can't look myself in the mirror and look at the guy who's looking back at me. I can't look myself in the black part of my eyes. It was disgusting, and I hated that. So if you take those four words, pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization, and you make an acronym out of them, it comes up with this word, P-A-I-D. And if you're new here tonight, I think that Dr. Bob and Bill get too much credit as being the co-founders of Alcoholics Anonymous and the booze doesn't. Because it's my experience, Alcoholics Anonymous couldn't do a doggone thing for me until I hit that pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. So if you're new tonight, I wish you one thing. I wish you the gift of desperation. Here's another acronym. G-O-D, gift of desperation. Talks about on page 28, we seek recovery with all the desperation, that of a drowning man. And until I got to that point, there was no help for me. Now back to this. There was nothing between me and me. So what I do, I met a girl. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a poor kid from the projects. And I meet a girl whose daddy owns a car dealership. Now, the part of Missouri where I'm from, that is the definition of love at first sight. <laughs> of course, the inevitable happens. I marry her. And, you know, I'll say this is, you know, if you're new here, look at the similarities that we have. And I'm going to tell you, make a full circle here. The person I relate to the most in the big book is the person that I have the least in common with in the big book. His name was Roland Hazard, and we get our ABCs from his experience. That's on page 26 and 27. He's the guy who said... He went over to Europe and met with the noted psychiatrist, the world's best psychiatrist that's probably ever lived. Met with him every Thursday for an hour or two in Sweden. My ears are popping bad. I'm sorry. Um, and, and he went over there and thought he understood the inner workings of the mind so well that relapse was impossible. I want you to know on the way to the ship, he got drunk. He came, went over to his parents, and this is where I don't have anything in common with him. He went over, and they sent him back. His parents were blue blood, very wealthy uh, people. His father was the mayor of the town. They made these wills for trains. Very wealthy. I had poor parents. 
He went to ed- school and got a good education. I didn't. He, his parents loved him. He had everything. I didn't. But yet I had this in common with him. He went back over there and Dr. Young told him the truth. He said, I can't help you. You are of the hopeless variety of alcoholic. I've never seen one single person who has a case extreme as yours ever recover. That's where we got our ABCs. That I am an alcoholic and can't manage my own life. That no human power could relieve me of my alcoholism. That see, God could and would. And he talked about these huge emotional displacements. These old ideas, attitudes, and beliefs that were once the guiding force in our life were suddenly cast aside and replaced with a completely new set of conceptions and motives that began to dominate them. And that's where I ended up. And so I got a lot out of that. I got a lot out of that. And what happened was, is I met a woman and I married her and I said, I'm going to do good. And I did. But then I started drinking again. And, and the, my trouble was is that no matter where I go, I can go too soon, I can go too far, but no matter where I go, there I are. Joe always shows up and screws things up. So I got married to her, and she just said, you know, you're drinking and you're corralling and everything's bad. I'm going to divorce you. So I did what, good, what any good self-respecting alcoholic would do. I got her pregnant. And, uh, and you know, to save the marriage. It was, it was, a, it was a good motive, you know. And, and, and I want you to know uh, is that my drinking escalated. I was not equipped uh, to be a father, to be a husband, to be anything other than an alcoholic. And uh, we were in the hospital, and she was having that Lamaze class and, and, and doing Lamaze where, Shh, here's a chip, I'll be right back. I've got to go downstairs and get my medicine. I drink some vodka, come back up. Well, when she had our daughter, they pulled the baby out, and I kissed her on the cheek. Because this blessed thing, I was so drunk. And, and she, when they pull the baby out, the lady's temperature goes down, and so she starts shivering. And I kissed her on her cheek, and it was cold as ice. And I said, you be, you've been cheating on me. Her father came in, and he's a Navy CB, and he, of course, we got into it. The police came, threw me out. And, you, you know, this, the arrogance and the self-centeredness of an active alcoholic. You know, the big book says an alcoholic in his cups is a very ugly creature, something to that effect. I went out and I got drunk because of the way they treated me. And I got in a car wreck. And on my Facebook, in my pictures, there's a picture of me in a wheelchair with a neck brace. I'm admitted to the hospital. The floor below, my wife and my daughter and that's, that's what kind of a pig I am. I'm a self-centered pig. And i got to tell you, out of respect to Alcoholics Anonymous, I, I introduced myself as an alcoholic. And one day when I was new, I was in a meeting, and I said, My name's Joe. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a drug addict. I'm a manic depressant. I'm a sex addict. And uh, a bunch of other stuff. And my sponsor was there, and he looks at me and goes, That's not good. So I go outside, and he gives me one of those Dutch uncle talks. That's where he talks. I listen. He says, for God's sakes, what are you doing? You don't go to the Catholic church and tell them change your homily because you're a Southern Baptist and want hellfire and brimstone. Out of respect to our primary purpose, you say you're an alcoholic. For your whole life, you've been trying to look at the differences instead of the similarities. And that's what's keeping you from getting well. If you can find yourself with the confine, within the confines of the first 164 pages of this book, there's hope for you. Until then, you're going to stay sick. And we went back in. And I respected that until one day I drove up to the clubhouse and his Lexit was, wasn't out front. So I said, this is my time. I'm going to make my move. And they called on me. They never called on me. But this particular day, there weren't very many people in the meeting. And finally, I was the last one. I said, all right, go ahead and share. Hurry up. (laughs) And I said, my name's Joe, and I'm a pig. (laughs) They go, oh, God, he's off his medicine. What the hell's a pig, Joe? I said, I'll shoot it, snort it, sniff it, smoke it, steal it, fight it. Or have sex with it if it'll change the way I feel. I can tell by the applause we have some other pigs out here. (laughs) 
Now, on Sunday nights, I've got about 30 guys I sponsor, and they come over to my home, and we have got a big book study for the guys I sponsor and my grand sponsees, and we call ourselves the Pigs Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's an acronym, and it's an acronym for this, People Interested in Growing Spiritually, you see? And we, we did that, and then we said, you know what, Joe? We should have something more. Once we go through the steps and we start sponsoring, we should be something better than pigs. So you give the guys something to shoot for, a mark to shoot for. I said, okay, well, why don't we become hogs? I said, well, that sounds good. What's a hog? H-O-G-S, helping others grow spiritually. And I'm going to tell you something. I can tell when I pulled up here, this is a room full of hogs. I'm telling you, there is a pocket of enthusiasm. Sarah was telling me about it. Steve was telling me about it. Eric was telling me about it. Anthony was telling me about it. My sponsor, Bob Darrell, who spoke here, was telling me about it. You guys are in the middle of something. It's always on page 100. When we look back, we realize you're in the middle of something here. There's an enthusiasm. For Alcoholics Anonymous. I'll tell you, when I pulled up here, I felt as though there should be, you know, this Ellis Island. They should have Bill Wilson in a flowing white robe holding up a first edition big book. And just like the Statue of Liberty, it should be inscribed, bring us your wretched refuse. This is something. You know, I I tell you, when I when I when I pulled up here, it kind of reminded me of uh, the world's most famous bank robber. You all have heard. Have you ever heard of Willie Sutton? He was the world's most famous bank robber. Every time he got out of jail, he'd go. It was just like an addiction. He'd go and he would rob a bank. And finally he got busted. And the judge says, look, Willie, I've got to send you away forever. But just answer this question. And it made the headlines of every newspaper. Why do you keep robbing banks? He goes, well, judge, that's a dumb question. I got the easiest answer in the world because that's where the money is. <laughs> And you see, I'm attracted to groups like this and people just like you because this is where the sobriety is. I stay away from the typhoid Mary AA members. Now, what was typhoid fever? Remember typhoid Mary? I believe it was in the 20s. There was an outbreak of typhoid fever all over the country and they couldn't figure out. And they finally traced it after much, much study. They found out that there was a... a, a uh, Drifter, who was a short order fry cook, and she had typhoid fever, but she only carried it. She didn't suffer from it. And I stay away from the naysayers. I find the people who are in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. Those are the ones that I want to be around. Those are the ones that I want to be alike. They're the ones who knew that the gift of their sobriety is something that they must pay. Roland Hazard on his tombstone He has an inscription. It says, what I had, I spent. What I saved, I lost. But what I gave, I have. And let me tell you, groups like this, you give it away by the bucket full. There's a saying that that you've got to give it away to keep it. And that may be true. I don't know. But I'm going to tell you my experience is you've got to give it away to get it. And people like you saved my life. Here I was. I couldn't get back in there no matter what I did. I couldn't get back in there. I couldn't get like you people. I would be in detoxes. I would be in treatment centers. I would be admitted to the state hospital. I'd have failed suicide attempts. I would overdose. I've been dipped, dunked, and sprayed. I'd put my hand on the TV and pray in earnestness with these televangelists. And I couldn't get sober. I started going. I mean, I'd do it all. I mean, here's how bad it'd go. I would get my big book. I would be drunk, of course. I'd put it down there. And I'd be in the bathroom, and there'd be the mirror. And I would be reading the big book. Rarely have we seen a person fail. And I'd say, and let me tell you about this. And when I was drinking, and here I was drunk, and I'd be crying, then I'd be reading another page. And I'd say, man, that's real. Wow. And I, I just couldn't get it. I just couldn't get it. I wanted it. They started sending me to psychiatrists. I saw a psychiatrist on, on uh, the Oprah show. My wife says, you need to go to him. His angry men, passive men, Marvin Allen. He wrote this book, and I went over. I went into this Indian sweat lodge with about 30 other guys. We were naked. We had this eagle feather with sage burning and we would flip it around and then all of a sudden we'd all say I hate you mom I hate you mom 
And it was February and it was freezing. And then we went and jumped in the Comal River. I tell you, all that made me thirsty. I got drunk on the way home. And it just got bad. I, I went to doctors. They medicated me. Nothing worked. Finally, I hit that pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. I took 38 Xanax, drank a half a gallon of Reuniti, slit my wrist, and as I lay there bleeding, I'm on the phone telling Jim and Tammy Faye, I can't believe you people work for those people. I'm going to tell you something. I've just committed suicide, and I'm dying right now. My wrist is bleeding. I took 38 Xanax, drank a half a gallon of Reuniti. When I die, I'm going to pee on baby Jesus' feet, and I'm going to tell him I'm going to be the very best satanic angel, and I'm going to come back and get you people. And apparently I passed out because the next thing I remember is I can't even kill myself. I'm a failure in every area of my life, and I can't even kill myself. And I wake up, and I'm in the Bear County Hospital. Now, by this time, I've been to all those what my wife's called charm schools, which are treatment centers. And I'm now going to the state Texas State and State Asylum. They put me in the Bear County Hospital, and I wake up. I have all this charcoal, and nothing's coming out. I mean, I'm just, and I rip everything out of my body, the IVs, the tubes coming down in my stomach from pumping it, and I jump out, and I jump out the window to my death, and I'm on the first floor. <laughs> I swear, I'm telling you. It wasn't funny then. They put me in a straitjacket, and they take me back to my alma mater. Now, my alma mater is the San Antonio State Hospital, Texas State Insane Asylum. I went there. I was awarded the state of Texas. I was living on SSI. I was in Section 8 housing. Um, I had to get my blood level checked to make sure I was on my medication twice a month. I had to see my psychiatrist once a week. I had to go to double trouble meetings. Uh, once a week, and I was taking 14 pills a day to sedate the intensity of my emotions. And I, they put me in a padded cell, nothing new there. I was in a straitjacket. I weighed 400 pounds. I shook all the time. Anything I would eat would immediately turn into water and run out. I had colitis. Whenever you saw me, I would be sweating, and you could smell the medication oozing out of the sweat out of my pores, and you could smell me in a room like this. You could smell me. I didn't have any hygiene, and I shook, and I couldn't talk, and I couldn't look at anyone. I was just a mumbling idiot, and I was whooped. And it was as though I was having an out-of-body experience. Dr. Colvin slid that open and looked at me. And he said, Joe, and I was as though I was having an out-of-body experience. I looked at him and said, Dr. Colvin, please don't send me back to Alcoholics Anonymous. Please give me a lobotomy. AA doesn't work for a guy like me. You see, I was never supposed to be born. I'm like the evil devil spawn. Something's wrong with me. I don't fit in anywhere. Just give me a lobotomy. He goes, Joe, there was a lady that came on our staff. She's looked at your case file. She's seen you come in here a few times. Her name is Kate Holy. God bless the people in the uh, recovery community and these professionals. God bless them. He said that she got kicked out of the Navy 17 years ago, and she has, she's a sober member of Alcoholics, of Alcoholics Anonymous for 16 years, and she said she wants to work with you. He says, I will not rule out the possibility of giving you electric shock treatments or something. He says, but Kate wants me to give you a final shot with her. And I go over to Miss Holy, and she sees me. She says, Joe, she goes, somewhere in your life you bought a lie about who you are and what the world is that you live in it. She goes, you may be a genius, but somewhere it's turned on you. She goes, you've got to get into Alcoholics Anonymous. You have got to work the steps. You have got to start sponsoring. You've got to be in the middle of it. You've got to have a home group. You've got to do service work. You must do this, Joe. She goes, because sooner or later, the psychotropics they have you on, it's going to eat away, and you're never going to be able to come back. Give AA a shot. She goes, 90% of the good things that are going to come through your life come through sponsoring. She goes, you've got to get in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. And she called a guy. The guy got sober February 7th. February 6, 1957. His name is James Allen Willis. He was my sponsor. He got his desire chip from Bill Wilson. 
I went over to him. I did. He says I didn't, but I did everything he asked me to do. (laughs) And I want you to know is where does that word slip come from? It comes from Bill Wilson on Tuesday nights would have a meeting at 182 Clinton Street. And one time this guy missed it three weeks in a row and they asked what happened to so and so. He's not here. Bill said he slipped. He slipped from what? He slipped from the grace of God. You see, what happened is when we come in here, we've got that grace of God that's shining on us. In page 28, seek recovery with all the desperation of a drowning man. Don't listen to these typhoid married people who say, oh, just take it easy. We'll work a stump a month. You know, if I'm on the USS Titanic and it says abandon yourself to God, abandon ship, I get off of it and I work the steps because there's a promise in the 12th step. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. Now, what's a spiritual awakening? It's a profound alteration to your reality reaction to life. It's a personality change sufficient enough to overcome alcoholism. You do, your past does not have to equal your future. Look at me. Do I look like a guy who's, uh, who's a ward of the state of Texas, who's the guy that I'm describing to you? And it's not of my own doing. When we had this moment of silence, the world is spinning around at a thousand miles an hour. There's this higher power. There's something bigger than us. And we serve that through the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. Bill Wilson, let me tell you, there was the most self-centered. He was probably more of a self-centered pig than me when he was in Towns Hospital. And get the newcomers phone numbers when they come here. I hear people say this all the time. Oh, if they don't want, if they don't ask for my number, I don't chase um, newcomers. They're not sincere. Oh, they go out all the time. Where did that bunk come from? My sponsor's going to get on me. He says I get up on a pulpit sometimes. But I'm telling you, I have a passion for Alcoholics Anonymous. I want to remind those people who don't do that is we wouldn't have a program of Alcoholics Anonymous if it wasn't a direct result of unsolicited 12-step calls. And I will give you four incidents. Roland Hazard, 12-step Ebby on a result of an unsolicited 12-step. Ebby, 12-step Bill, un, as a result of an unsolicited 12-step. Bill, 12-step Dr. Bob, as a result of an unsolicited 12-step. December, or July 4th, 1935, Dr. Bob and Bill solicited Bill Dotson, AA number three, the man in the bed, as a result of an unsolicited 12-step call. When, and and that, that's what I do is because those people, whenever I was at my worst, they came up to me and they saw, and people were scared of me. I tipped over a Coke machine because it didn't give me my quarterback. I threw a chair at an old man. I got blackballed from Club 12. They blackballed me. And I want you to know the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous. They called me and asked me last year to speak and be their spiritual speaker at their 61st anniversary. And I said, you got to be kidding me. Don't you have a bylaw in your charter that you can't have somebody you've 86 be a spiritual speaker there? And they said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> so this is what Alcoholics Anonymous has done for me. It didn't get me well where I could, I could um, feel good and get out there. It got me where I could... Go out there and carry this message to another person who's sober. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous has done for me. And a few of the things that it's done is as a result of this, I started sponsoring. Five months sober, I was awarded the state of Texas. My sponsor went over to the state of Texas, went to the court and signed papers, and I became a ward of my sponsor. Six months sober, I was off all medication. I went to a um, retreat And Dr. Bob's son was a good friend of mine, and he introduced me to my wife, Suzanne. I, there isn't anything that Alcoholics Anonymous couldn't ask me to do that I wouldn't gladly give back. I sponsor because it's a pleasure, and it's because it's a duty, it's because it's an insurance policy, and it's because I'm paying back what was given to me. Those, that's on page 181 of Dr. Bob, and that's, that's why I do it. I was able to walk my daughter down the aisle. Now, that may not sound like a big thing unless you've missed it, but I would have missed it. My daughter from my first marriage, the one whose mother I said, you've been cheating on me. She asked me to walk her down now, and I said, I won't do it. She goes, what would you say, Daddy? I said, I won't do it unless your stepfather's on the other side of you. And we did it because he was the man that I couldn't be. And I've got a great relationship with them. Some of the things that happened is all of a sudden I was like a, a semi-pro AA missionary and I seemed to miss that part about 
um, working and stuff. And, and I just, I run across a little bit of money and I started business and I got to be quite wealthy, quite successful. And I had what I call a whiskey in the milk idea. If I'm making a lot of money doing this, what if I duplicated about 30 times? Well, we all know what happened. I quit going to so many meetings. I started um, devoting. I, I violated the sixth tradition. Uh, we ought never endorse, finance, or lend the A name to any related facility or outside enterprise. Less problems of money, property, prestige divert me from my primary purpose. That became my God. And I started working hard. And then I lost $1.3 million of my own money. And I was totally broke. My wife hated me. My kids hated me. I quit going to meetings. This is at 15 years sober. And I wanted, I found myself one day with a bunch of pills in my hand wanting to kill myself. And I said, my God, Joe, what's happened? And I said, who in the world? Jim is 84 years old. And I really he haven't kept that good a contact with him because he's older now. And I said, who's the one person that I respect more that I would do surrender my ego to? And they come up with one guy, and that was Bob Darrell. And I get hold of Bob. He talked to me for two days on the phone. He got me into inventory. He had me do a fist step. He flew down to Houston. I met with him, and I did my fist step. And I had 64 resentments at 15 years sober. And this isn't good math, but I had 91 amends, and I've only got three left out of all of those. And I'm a free man. I, um, I, I cannot tell you the importance of having sponsorship. My wife and daughter loved me. That was restored. I got in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. I made those amends. And I started living the life that I think that God wants me to. There's the central fact in my life is I want to be conscious of the presence of God. And it's not my job to set things right. It is my job to see things right. And I have to see you right to see me right. There seems to be a triadic connection here. God, you, me. And if there's a disconnect in any of those, then there's a disconnect with my God. You see, I had to stop looking at life through a microscope. And I had to start looking at life through a mirror. I started working the program of Alcoholics Anonymous in reverse. You see... It says twice in the big book that our troubles are of our own making. And I started thinking Joe's trouble were of y'all's making. And that doesn't work. And the bad thing about being a victim is victims never get well. I took everything personal. Well, what happened was, is I was on, um, Bob had me go. He says, before I went down to Houston to do my fist step. He says, who's your biggest resentment? I said, oh, I'm on this foundation with this guy, and he's a rotten jerk. He burned me. He changed the minutes, fired the secretary, uh, and burned me, character assassinated, and I want to kill him. And when you hear this, you'll probably tell me some sort of Vegas concoction to poison him. And uh, he said, all right, good. He goes, before you come down to Houston, I want you to call this guy. I said, all right, I'm fine. What do you want me to tell him? And he says, I want you to tell him, you know, Tony... I shouldn't have said his name. You know, the last two years of my life, I've been self-rule run right, and I've been a horrible, despicable human being, and you're one of the people who saw right through my crap, and I want to thank you for that and calling me on that. And I'm trying to live life on a spiritual basis now, and I want to come over and make an amends to you, and whatever it is I've done, and I've got a list I want to make right, and if there's anything you want to add to it that I can make right, I want you to tell me, because whatever's between you and me isn't going to be there anymore. And then Bob said, now, what did I tell you to say? And I repeated that back to him. He says, now, when you get there at his house, before you go in, I want you to call me. Just a little reminder, if your sponsor ever tells you this and you're on a cell phone, go, I'm sorry, we got a bad connection. I call him and he says, all right, here's what I want you to do. After you say that, no matter what he says to you, you say, you know, I never thought of it this way. But I'll get with my sponsor and get back with you. And he goes, now, here's the thing I want you to do, the final thing is after you do this, I want you to get on your knees. I want you to hold his hands, and I want you to say the third step prayer so that hopefully with God's grace you'll never be that despicable person in the world. I didn't want to do that, you guys, because I was right. But you see, do I want to be right or do I want that whiskey? 
I want to be free. Program of Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't allow me to settle for uh, relief. It, it gives me an opportunity to be free. And I went in there and I made that amends. Now, the bad news is the good news, is this guy loves me now. He goes to meetings. If my car is out there, he's going to go in and sit next to me, and, and we're best friends. <laughs> but that's because of sponsorship. See, that is the most important thing in sponsorship is that I remain sponsorable. I want to tell you all that Alcoholics Anonymous is so much fun. Alcoholics Anonymous, if you're not enjoying it, it's, it's, it's like sex. If you're not enjoying it, you're doing something wrong. I heard that once and I said, Jesus, I remember the first time I had sex. It wasn't fun. Let me see. I didn't know what I was doing, much like when I was a newcomer. I was scared. I was afraid. And I was alone. (laughs) Y'all are relating to that a little too much. (laughs) Now, why do I say that? My wife gets mad at me when I say that. But the reason I tell you that is because, you see, sobriety like sex is a lot more fun when you're with people. And that's why I love groups like y'all's. Okay, somewhere along the line, I became we. And that's really a big deal. I became we. I tell you, I, I got into sponsorship and service work, and I'll tell you a couple of funny things, is I was sponsoring two identical twins who were both nurses, John and David. And they'd come to me after the 7 a.m. and I said, would you make up your mind? I mean, I keep telling you the same thing over and over again. You act like it's the first, thing, first time I've ever told you this. Gee, many, make up your mind. And another thing, is your name John or David? You, every day you, he goes, they were identical twins. I didn't know this, okay? And, and uh, one time they asked me to be Santa Claus because I weighed almost 400 pounds. And I was Santa Claus at Club 12 on a, on a, on a uh, Saturday morning, and we were serving food, and then all the kids would come up sit on my lap. And as I was serving food, they came over to get me because I'm this big, tough guy and playing Santa Claus. And they said, Joe, Joe, Cowboy Glenn's out there beating up Debbie, his al wife. And I run out there, and I grab that guy, and I throw him down and kick him, say, you never hit a woman. We're going to have the police come right now. And I turn around, and there's this little boy saying, Mom, I don't want to sit on his lap. <laughs> I became a 12-step athlete. I got into this book. I hooked up with Joe Hawk and Mark Houston, and we went around thumping the world with a big book. I had a black T-shirt that said, Work the Steps or Die MF-er. I had my BF sister. I had my BF sifter in my hand. I shaved my head. Our first group, Conscience of the Truth Seeker, I knocked a guy out. It was bad. Um, We would go rip people off bar stools if their wife called and take them. Well, what happened is one time my sister and I were 12-stepping. She's not really my sister, but we were 12-stepping, and we got sober together. We call each other brother and sister. And there was a girl and two girls. One of them had a prosthetic leg. And we went over, and we took them to this big book study in Corpus Christi. And while we were there, the girls went out down and started turning tricks for drinks. Carrie calls me and says, what do we do? I said, well, we go get them. Say, hey, these are members of Alcoholics Anonymous. Work the steps or die. Do not serve them again. We take them upstairs. Carrie calls and says, Joe, they're back down there. Well, this time I go down there and we take the prosthetic leg off this girl. And, <laughs> and you know, as alcoholics, we're cunning, baffling, powerful. And, and what happened was she hopped down there. <laughs> And so these are some humorous things. You know, we had a lot of fun. We really do. And I, I want to tell you a story in closing. I want to tell you a story, and, and this describes Alcoholics Anonymous for me and what it's done for me more than any story I've ever heard. And I'm not quite sure where I heard it or where I read it or how I got it. But I, I want to say this, is that the word personality comes from, a, I don't know if it's Latin, but it's a word that means mask. You know, a profound alteration to your reaction to life, a personality change sufficient enough to overcome alcoholism. It's a quite often the new uh, others see it in the newcomer before they themselves see it. You see, 
What, what it is, is there was a story of this princess who didn't have a king to marry. And, and it was a patriarchal society. And if she married another king from another kingdom, he would inherit all of her kingdoms. She didn't want that to happen. So what she did, she came up with this, this plan. And what she would do is she would marry one of the people in the kingdom, one of the available bachelors. But because she knew most everybody there, she says, we're going to have you put on a mask and you're going to come. 200 men showed up. One of them was this alcoholic thief convict who just got out of prison with a horribly disfigured, scarred face. And he heard about this contest and he got hold of a bunch of cons who got out. One of them was a master craftsman that could make a wonderful, wonderful mask. The other one was a butler who knew how to talk and knew how to do all this. Another one was a tailor who could make him some really fancy clothes. And they schooled him. And I want you to know out of 200 guys, he made it down to the 50th. After a couple of weeks, he was down in the top three. And those three stayed with the queen or the princess for a month. And at the end of the month, the queen had everybody into the courtyard of the kingdom said, I've made my decision. And she goes, I choose. And she points at him. But you see, this is where the table turns on him. He experiences something he's never felt before. His lip starts quivering and this water starts coming out of his eyes. And this emotion he's never, ever felt before comes up. And something blurts out of his mouth and he doesn't even know he's going to do it. Something just overtakes him. And he says, my princess, I cannot do this to you. I'm so ashamed of myself. You see, I'm a bad alcoholic. I'm a thief. I have a disfigured face. I'm a convict. And he told her about the scam he was trying to pull. And she starts crying and says, how could you ever do this to me? She goes, I can never trust again. And he goes, I know I'm ashamed of myself. I'm sorry, I'll leave. And she goes, but before you leave, I banish you. But before you leave, I want you to take off your mask. And he says, OK, and he takes off his mask and she looks at him and says, well, I don't like your sense of humor, but you had me going. He goes, what are you talking about? You see, we don't have to be that SOBs we used to be. Our past does not equal our future in Alcoholics Anonymous. The old timers look at you and they say you're the most important person in the room because they're not looking at who you think you are. They're looking at who you like they can become. She got a mirror and handed it to him. And he looked in that mirror. And he saw the most beautiful and handsome and sweetest and kindest and sincere and vulnerable and intimate person he's ever met before. And I want you to know that my family, society, and Alcoholics Anonymous thanks you for what you all have done for me. There's one thing I forgot to say, and it must. You know, it's when we look back, we realize that lady who who said, sent me to Jim Willis and Alcoholics Anonymous, that lady, Kate Holy. I worked for CSO at the International in San Antonio this past. And this lady comes up and I'm working for them at the bookstore. And I'm selling her a bunch of books. And she looks down at my name tag and she turns red and leaves. And I look at Suzanne, the manager of CSO, and I said, man, I don't know what I did to her. And she says, I don't know. And she goes, Joe, 15 minutes later, she says, Joe, this lady needs to see you in my office alone. I don't know what happened. And I walk in there and this lady looks at me. And she says, Joe, you may not remember me. She goes, but I've been praying for you every day for 17 and a half years now. My name is Kate Holy, and I'm the one that sent you to Alcoholics Anonymous. God will not do one thing for anybody in Alcoholics Anonymous that he won't do for everyone. Avail yourself to this higher power. Abandon yourself. And find others. In the medical view of Alcoholics Anonymous in Appendix 3, Dr. W. W. Bauer says that an alcoholic knows he must get along without drinking. And he overcomes his excessive concentration on self by absorbing himself in helping others find their um, solution. And that's the answer. That's the answer. Thank you very much. Thank you.